Hey everyone, this is Doug Custon, and you're listening to the We WFM podcast, which aspires to be the go-to source for all things workforce management. I've been looking forward to speaking to this guest for some time um, because he specializes in deploying workforce management process and technology into operational areas such as retail, manufacturing, healthcare. And that's in complete contrast to my career, um, which has been dominated by operating in contact centers. He's also a kindred spirit to our mission at WFM and really believes that we as a workforce management community can take the profession to new heights um, if we only band together as that community. We get into all sorts of interesting topics ranging from WFM career paths, common mistakes made in deploying workforce management technology, some of the nuances and differences between contact center workforce management compared to workforce management deployed in other industries, such as retail, for example. I think you're going to enjoy this episode. I certainly did. Okay, it's time to welcome our special guest, Napoleon, who has a super interesting background, having made his way into workforce management from finance. He has over 10 plus years experience deploying workforce management technologies and processes into retail, manufacturing, healthcare, public sector, life science and banking operations, as well as a brush uh, with the contact center workforce management world as well. In my opinion, this gives Napoleon a really unique perspective uh, and I'm personally very, very interested to, to learn from. Napoleon, great to have you on the podcast. Thanks for taking the time. Um, like I said, I just I've been really looking forward to this chat. Really Likewise, cool. mate. Uh, I, is this a real saying? Not to piss in your in your pocket. <laughs> yeah. But I've been following you for a really long time, and I'm I'm really excited to be here to have this conversation with you. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. So we, we're going to talk about some obviously some workforce management topics. That's what we do at WFM. Um, but we we also really believe in in getting to know the the people behind the numbers because I think workforce management in general is kind of seen as a numbers game and it is, but there's some real life stories and people behind it and um, this is also part of our kind of our our mission and and I wish to to, to get that um, get that stories from from behind. So so first off, um, I think probably start with what part of the world are you based in and uh, and and what do you currently do for work. I'm in North America. I'm in Vancouver, British Columbia, in Canada. Um, it's I love it out here. Uh, we just moved here like three years ago from from Toronto. Uh -huh. Yeah, so that's where I'm based. And in terms of work on a day to day, gosh, it's never the same. Not not to say any two days are not the same. More like any two weeks are not the same. Uh, <laughs> we have several clients on the go. And it could it could vary from you know helping um, develop corporate strategies around WFM uh, or delivering actual you know solutions technologies. Um, and right now we service um, UKG uh, as as far as technology goes, but we've done various technologies in the past. Uh, workforce in uh, workforce software, in four uh, Red Prairie, Dayforce. And, but right now we're focused on UKG. So, you know, it varies either, you know, delivering technology or, or it's some sort of strategic engagement. And um, do you want to give it the company a shout out? Oh, for sure. Uh, so I, I work for a boutique firm based out of Georgia named Stability. Uh, shout out to, uh, to, to, my, to my VP, Chris, uh, you know, hopefully you get to watch this. Um, the owners, Rob and James, they're, they're fantastic. To be honest with you, like in this space right now, mm. uh, we're, I want to say the largest uh, UKG partner uh, and one of the larger um, WFM uh, shops out here in North America. Mm. But as large as we are, it's still got a very nice boutique feel. Um, mm. we're, mm. we're still under 150 people, I think, but growing very fast. Oh, wow. Okay. I, I think, I think that's um, 150 boutique and still calling yourself boutique, but I think <laughs> that's, but that's, that's really cool and dedicated to workforce management as well, which is, is super, super interesting. Um, yeah, it is. So a couple more personal questions for me. So mm -hmm. 
this one for me is really interesting. We've we've had a, a couple of um, previous people on the podcast that have given some some real golden nuggets in terms of who who influenced them. Um, but what would you say are the three people that have been the most influential to you in your in your career or your life or uh, whichever, mm. whichever makes sense? So we'll we'll take a mix. So in my personal life, uh, shout out to my mom and dad, mm. biggest influence. Both positive and negative. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know um, what you're saying. Yeah. Right. Um, my wife and, and my kids definitely. Uh, I've 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 grown a lot just from mm-hmm. from being um, being around them and, and having them in my life. Uh, professionally, I'll I'll have to say, shout out to Bilkis, Bilkis Zakaria. She uh, and she's no longer the CFO of IKEA Canada, but she was the CFO of IKEA Canada for uh, a good time, over a decade, I believe. And she's the one who gave me my break into, mm. into workforce management. So I was, uh, I was in finance and um, I oversaw, you know, the, the financials of a couple of stores, Ikea stores, if you're familiar with the big box. I nearly ended up working for them actually at one point. Yeah. I was, oh, did you really? Yeah. I had a contract offer and everything. It just unfortunately fell through, um, but it, yeah. I mean, that's a whole different story. Um, yeah, I, I was a uh, great company, I care. Really great. Yeah, yeah, fantastic company. And, you know, having that finance background, we had this big question in finance, how can we optimize our payroll spend? Mm. And along with that came the question of, you know, well, we need to move our timekeeping processes, our scheduling processes from pen and paper into a system and hopefully, you know, uh, shrink that spend by, by some order of magnitude. We didn't even have a target at that time. And I led that, you know, she, she kind of took a chance with me. I didn't have any workforce management background, mm. but I understood what we were trying to do mm. and the project at hand. Um, and she gave me a shot and that changed essentially my, my trajectory in my career. Cool. Okay. Uh, well, I want to come back on the, the topic of finance and in, in a bit, actually, because I think it's, there's definitely a lot that workforce management can learn from the finance um, kind of arena um but before we do that just one more sort of personal question so um th- th- and again this is super interesting for me so <laughs> i i think i've said, already said this on the podcast but um i actually started blogging um about workforce management because i got sick and tired of people asking me what do i do for a career um <laughs> like and you know you get these uh sometimes these questions like how do you describe your crew your your what you do for a job for to your your kids or yeah to your mum and dad and oh boy I, <laughs> even today i still struggle um yeah I, now i just say well go 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 read the blogs yeah um yeah i, but, I agree but just in your own words what's what, what does the phrase workforce management mean to you and um how, how would you go about explaining it if you had to explain it to say to, to your kids interesting so great question and and i've heard your your, your previous uh, guests answer this and and i i love it i love the variation in their responses yeah there's a lot all correct right <laughs> for me you know how i explain workforce management in its simplistic sense is it's a set of activities right performed by an organization to optimize the productivity of its workforce mm. that's and I thought about this for a long time, even you know, prior to, to, to listening to your podcast, and, and that's how I distilled it. It's pretty much you have to do a bunch of things um, within your organization to improve the productivity of your workforce. And you know, the bunch of things varies by what industry you're in, right? Yeah. Um, whether you're in healthcare, manufacturing, your call center, and even how you define workforce varies. Mm-hmm you know, by what industry you're in. So in call center, you guys have bots over there now and automation and all all kinds of cool things. Those are part of your workforce, right? Now you have to optimize machines and optimize Mm -hmm. what people do and combine the optimizing their productivity. So that's how I think of what workforce management is. How do I explain it to to people? Um, So I help organizations uh, essentially figure out how to optimize their, their workforce. There used to be a running joke amongst my friends. I don't know if you ever watched the movie um, Up in the Air. 
George Clooney. I did, yeah, I did, yeah. <laughs> did you? Yeah, I have. So they that, thought yeah. I was actually quite like that film. Yeah. <laughs> they thought I was that guy who who came around and you know essentially he, yeah, told I'll, executives, "Oh, you got to chop off like exactly percent of your people mm. or whatever craziness that they mm. were you know, that they thought." But yeah, so it's not that at all. You know, well, when we come around, we're not there to to mm. get people fired. Um, we're just there to help optimize your oper your operation. I, I think that's a really great point, and it, in some ways, workforce management has almost had a bad name in some circles because, yeah, it, it, by improving productivity, of course, you know, if that means that you don't need as many people, um, then it can be seen as kind of the I was the driver for that job cut um, or the George Clooney. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, likewise, I've had as many situations in my career where actually I've said to the operation, do you know what? You don't have the right number of people. Um, mm -hmm. You need to increase it. Um, Absolutely. And um, it's, a, it's a double edged sword. It's, it's not just about necessarily for me, the, yeah, exactly what you said about cutting jobs is about right sizing yeah. operation and, and, and making them efficient. Um, I think that's, that's yeah. Super, Absolutely. super interesting point. Absolutely. And right sizing for, you know, for me, it's always a, a last option. Uh, um, to let go of people or cutting headcount. Mm, mm. Uh, you know, they're, depending on, on what an organization is trying to do, you, you always can get more out of your people. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so, so ra rather than letting people go, what else can you get out of, out of the people that you already mm. have before you let them go? The pandemic was really interesting where there were a bunch of layoffs in the beginning. Mm. And then you had, a, you know, now we're in this weird situation where everyone's scrambling for talent. It's exactly the problem. What, uh, you know, what happens when you let go of mm. people before thinking through, you know, what you really need. And, and, and I always say as well, the be careful about that particular decision because it's not one to take lightly, e even if no. you just take it back to the numbers, take it back to, the efficiency and productivity of your business right um if you're finding that you're needing to cut and then later on board um this then probably is it end up costing you an awful lot more than you saved in terms of making that that cut at that point because the time Definitely. to compensate and all these sorts of things which yeah Definitely. it costs a lot to acquire talent um uh, in terms of you know sourcing it uh recruiting training um, not to mention, you know, the opportunity cost of the lost productivity the whole time that you've been understaffed. Um, so, yeah, I, I agree 100%. Mm. So going back on the finance side of your, your experience, <laughs> obviously, that was a, yeah. a while back now. Um, one of the things which I think that I'm keen to get across is that there's a lot that workforce management can learn from finance. I mean, finance obviously has been around a lot longer than workforce management for a start. Um, but I also think that there's really to, if you want to be influential within your organization, you need to have a strong grip of that side of the, the, the business. Um, what, what are your thoughts on how, how workforce management can improve its outcomes by adding financial impacts or financial planning and analysis? What knowledge do you think workforce management professionals can, can take from the finance world? So I actually think at least here in North America, um, workforce management is very much in line with, with finance, mm. right? Because usually, if you look at just where we sit in operations today, right? Commonly, um, just broadly speaking, uh, you have executive teams and the leadership set their, their goals, right? The, the sort of high level direction of where we need to go. Then usually finance then breaks that down into, you know, what are the numbers or, or, or what does that look like operationally to make it work? And then they pass it on to workforce management and um, to sort of, hey, go make that happen. Like that's, <laughs> that's, that's kind of how it works today. Um, and I think workforce management has a good understanding of those results because we're held to account a lot for, for finances numbers, right? Whether they're correct or wrong, because they're, they're never perfect. But I think I think it's a really important question you, you bring about what can we learn from finance as workforce management. So if I step back, right, if you think of finance, um, finance has a pipeline of talent. Now I'm, I'm talking not within the organization, but within the knowledge domain. So 
finance has a pipeline of talent from your undergrad, right? The moment you graduate from university, um, there is a path for you. So you can you learn a finance, a financial degree or a degree in finance. There are financial professional organizations you can join. And then once you've gotten your accreditation, you have entry level finance jobs, mm. right? So you can be a financial analyst or, or whatever kind of um, sort of entry level role. You have a manager role, you have a senior manager in finance, right up to a CFO. So there is a track, right? And we don't have that in workforce management. Everyone that I know in workforce management just stumbled into it. Yep. No one went to school for it. No. <laughs> <laughs> and so few are fortunate to have it as a career. So few, because a, a lot of us just, you know, might fall into it. It's a couple of years here and there. And if they can't make anything useful out of it, they, they drop out. They go into something else, uh, customer service, um, you know, other analyst type of roles, because there's, there isn't that track for them to grow. So we are stunting our own growth as a knowledge domain within workforce management because we don't have that, you know, that track to guide talent from uh, university or even from college um, right into the workplace and, mm. you know, and, and up the, the career ladder, if you will. So that's, that's the biggest thing we could learn from finance. I think, I mean, that's for me, being very passionate about this career, I think that's the dream. The, the time when I see a university truly adopt um, a, a career path, I think is, is a, we, we came very close to it with, um, with the University of Ulster. Oh um, yeah? Yeah, they, they, had, they actually had um, planning in their curriculum for a, a customer service contact center type degree. Um, wow. So it was really close. And, I, and I, at one point I thought, yeah, they're gonna have something really dedicated to this, but it, it just didn't quite happen. So one of these days, one of these Do days. Do you know why? Um, yeah, some of it was um, just because they, they were aligned with a membership organization and unfortunately they decided to split ways. I think they just weren't able to market it enough and um, which was a real shame. Um, mm -hmm. but I, I still truly believe that this will exist one day. And um, yeah, who knows? Maybe somebody out there is listening to this. He goes, yeah, that's, that's, that's good. Let's, let's get that. Let's make that happen. Um, I hope so. I, I really believe that that will happen in our lifetime for sure. Um, another thing which um, I, I was keen to pick your brains on, um, just moving away from the, the finance side of things, which, which, by the way, I think is, is a really good point. Um, so I know that you've got a lot of experience with deploying workforce management technology. And of course, I think and I'm guessing that a lot of that's probably outside of the contact center as well, which I think is pretty much all, all of it. Yeah. All of it is out there. Okay. okay. Yeah. So a lot of it, look to a lot of our audience today, that's, this is going to be super new stuff. Um, we could probably do a whole episode just on that. So we better, better not go too deep on it, but okay. based on your extensive experience in, in setting up systems, what, what are the common mistakes and recommendations that, that you would make for, for a successful rollout of workforce management technology? Hmm. Broadly speaking, um, most folks who, who go after the technology don't put as much effort in looking internally at their own processes mm. um, and how they work. You know, the, the technology becomes a panacea. The research is out there. Yes, you, if you put in a technology, you might get some ROI of, you know, X percentage, you know, um, and, and it's, all, it's all good. But the thing with the technology is it's going to force you to work a different way, right? Uh, different technologies are in, work inherently, you know, largely the same, but have different um, sort of constraints. And those constraints will change the way you work. Mm. So if you don't lead with looking internally at your own processes, um, figuring out how, what's the best way of us working, right? And then once you've flushed out what those processes are, then go find the technology that fits that. Um, that's usually the largest pitfall. So a lot of customers, you know, they've already bought this thing. They're trying to, you know, rear-end it into, into their current operations <laughs> and it's not working and, and they're left wondering, you know, why? And so, they're, you know, I've seen a lot of projects on hold or, or have to, you know, take a break um, to sort of figure out what went wrong. And usually that's the case. Um, 
and you know it speaks to not having that knowledge domain within the organization or them not going out to get the right help to, to figure that out first before going after the technology do you know what i relate to that as well and i'm not just saying that so yeah. i think so i when i first started doing what if i was manager in the context, uh, in the context and i was everything was done on spreadsheets and um actually i always say that that's well in fact emil on the our last episode said um something very similar that kind of that gives you a good feel for the method um so you know which you know what buttons yeah what, what you're doing what the sorry what the technology is doing when you're pushing the buttons but i won't say who but we we had a took a workforce management technology uh, into the contact center to replace the spreadsheets because we'd been sold the whole ri yeah uh, and it sat there probably on the shelf for two years um and actually what we were doing we were doing the scheduling in the spreadsheet still and then uploading it into the workforce management technology yeah um, because because it didn't fit our processes um yeah. you're exactly the reason why it's wow it's almost like you were talking to my story there yeah and what what happened afterwards i mean did how did you did you end up using that solution after all and what did it take well well for, first of all we realized that we we hadn't appreciated exactly what the return on investment that we were seeking um so we weren't you know we've we've been told a story around this is where we'd get the benefit without actually probably doing our due diligence ourselves um i think that was one the second one was i think slight resistance because we were doing kind of team-based scheduling and it just didn't make we just couldn't get it to function in the same way for the way that we were currently scheduling ultimately we ended up changing the way we scheduled mm. in order to adopt the practice and actually that's where we then started delivering the benefit as well um and it yeah it required us to change our process and that probably wasn't a bad thing in that particular instance but there was yeah. a lot of resistance to it up front and it just hadn't been thought about so it's two years of costs that have been basically flushed down the toilet as a as a result 100 uh, two years of the roi and and license and you know subscriptions and yeah it's expensive if uh, so i mean in terms of technology i know excuse you i know that you've not got extensive contacts and um experience but for for the people that are listening here from the content of the world mm -hmm. how does the technology differ in for the non contacts in the world let's call it sorry to, to right. kind of generalize i really hate saying this but they're pretty much the same i mean they all work the same way I think the, the best way I can put it in, into context for you is what are the what are the main differences between um, let's say Verant and is it Genesis? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, the way you would think of the differences between those two is the way you'd think of the differences between um, let's say you know Verant and Dayforce or you know UKG or whatever you know pick whatever product that's out there. Not many. I mean, it's it's very nuanced, specific uh, feature differences, but large, by and large, they they pretty much work the same way. Do do, do you find the richness of data though is still there? So uh, the reason I ask that question is I I always struggled in say back office areas. I, I I had this bizarre moment once where I walked in to an operational leader and said, "Do you know how much workload you got?" And he said, "Yeah, sure, come in." The back here i've got 10 tons of work and literally he had boxes that he would use every day to tell him how much work he had do, do you find that's a challenge um say in i don't know um retail for example where you're looking at footprint and com completely different um type metrics i guess to, to to measure workload so i think the challenges are the same right um leaders are looking to to have actionable information at their fingertips um, right when they need it, right? And so there are differences in the types of data you're capturing. You know, yes, that might that might make a product unique for a particular industry, right? So for example, mm -hmm. in retail, um, you know, your, your labor drivers would be, let's say, you know, sales or, or number of customers, um, you know, that are coming, walking in the door, customers served, transactions, you know, so yes, the data itself might be a little bit different, but the way it's used is, is pretty much the same. Got it. Um, what I do appreciate though about call center workforce management is you guys are ahead of the game. You might not think so, but you have data sets, 
much greater than any other industry for you to work on, right? So imagine this in retail, right? Um, you, you, have a, you have your storefront and a customer is walking by in front to look at the window, right? They see the product in the window. Uh, it might be interesting. It might not be interesting. They don't actually walk in the store. They just keep walking by, mm -hmm. right? And so you don't have that, that data in retail, whereas mm -hmm. you know, in WFM, that you have that data, right? Someone calls, they hung around, and they decided to, you know, to hang up and, mm -hmm. and didn't wait for anyone to pick up, right? So those little variances mm. are what I think make your data, data sets richer. You have way more data on the different activity and touch points that you have in your, in your workflows um, than, you know, than other businesses or other industries. And you pretty much, I mean, that's, uh, as you were saying that, I think you've probably sort of answered some of the questions that I've been wanting to ask for a long time around kind of the differences and i think to summarize you're saying there isn't a huge amount of difference in terms of the output and and the methods that you're using but there's differences in terms of the metrics and input that you are required in order to derive the same outputs absolutely and i mean the the vendors are making strides right so now in a lot of retail um organizations if you just look up you will see sensors everywhere right so the moment you walk in the store there will be a sensor. It'll capture how many people come in and to the point where it can measure, you know, are you male, are you female, are you a kid? Wow. Um, they'll track where you're going, right? Wow. So, so, so they know what hot spots, what are the hot spots within the store? What are the cold spots? So they can calculate if they were to put a bin with, you know, with pillows in there, you know, what's the sales, um, what's the sales ratio of, you know, traffic to, 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 to sales of that particular item in a particular spot. So we are making strides in, in that regards, but it's, I think it's still unparalleled. Uh, call center, you guys have all the data set, like everything. It's a, it's a data person's dream to work on a call center data set. Do you know what? I'm, I'm never going to walk into a retail store now with the same viewpoint. <laughs> uh, I'm going to be looking around um, and wondering, <laughs> yeah, if I touch this bin and have I, have I just uh, created a new forecast? I don't know. Uh, that's funny. They're watching everywhere. <laughs> um, cool. So moving on, um, uh, in a previous episode with Emery Ong, we, he mentioned that one of the reasons why workforce management adoption is so much higher in, in North America than, say, in Europe, and, mm -hmm. I, and we were just talking about this before we started recording, um, is because of how hard the technology vendors have pushed the topic. He, he mentioned sort of huge big conferences with people flying in from all over the continent. I've experienced a little bit of that in the UK as well, um, not to the extent that Emery was was talking about. And, and I would say probably I'm extremely grateful for for this. I, I wouldn't have had the career that I've had, I think, if it hadn't been pushed so hard by, by WFN technology. And we mentioned this earlier in terms of around getting your, your, your process and your, and your people right first before you put technology and I'm I'm a big firm believer in in people and process before technology and technology being an enabler so that really relates to me what are though your thoughts on kind of the adoption subject and why do you think um us as a workforce community what do we need to do to really true achieve those new heights I, I think you mentioned one of them being sort of that career path but what else yeah. do you think if I understand your question Sorry, that was a long winded question, right? <laughs> no, so there is higher adoption in North America than in uh, in Europe or other parts of the world. And uh, and your previous um, uh, guest was was spot on. The technology um, vendors in North America, you know, they lead the charge in spreading workforce management knowledge. That's how I learned about workforce management. We we deployed Kronos into ikea um, and with that they have a robust training mm -hmm. uh protocol day force all the vendors genesis verant like they all have these training training courses to use their product and inherently you are teaching workforce management right mm -hmm. um i think the next chapter of of workforce management for us as a community is to take that out of the hands of the the vendors right and centralize that somewhere outside the, the the technology space because 
the vendors, rightfully so, are teaching workforce management, but only in the narrow context of their application mm. or their technology. So the way you do workforce management at one company might end up looking different at another company just because you use yeah. different tools. I think as a community, right, like when, once we get our big boy pants on, right, um, would be to, to do exactly what the PMI comes to mind, right? Um, if you think of project management, before the 19, is it 1960s, before the 1960s, project management has been around forever, right? Very um, true. Yeah, in one form or another. Yeah. In one yeah. form or another. I mean, they were building pyramids in the ancient times, and I'm sure they had some form of project yeah. management. Like, yeah, I'm, I mean, I, I don't even know how they built them, but they must have, yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? You, you, some way of defining your work structure and blah, 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 figuring out who brings what and what happens when, they, they, they had that. And somewhere along the line, you know, a group of people came together and say, hey, let's standardize this. Let's make this uniform for everyone to come in and learn and do it the same way. This probably was in the late 70s. That's when the PMI here in North America, mm -hmm. there was another organization in the UK, um, and they did that, right? They, they established this organization uh, and they started spreading the knowledge. Now, the founding fathers of PMI were, were college professors. They were able to, to research because they were interested in this stuff, right? So they had the academic resources to, you know, to sort of put out the literature, academic literature on project management as well. And so you have other people in other parts of the world taking this on and saying, hey, you know, there, there's some credibility there because you know it's academic literature, they take it on, they start learning, and it gets traction. We need that in workforce management. You know, we, we need a, a single source, uh, a body, if you will, that oversees this knowledge output of, of what workforce management is in different industries, um, how it could be applied, and it, you know, how it can evolve. I think to answer your question, that you know, that's what we would need to do beyond what the vendors are doing today. So I agree. Yeah. Um, yeah. I need to find this university that can crack the crack it open. Um, I think that's, I definitely think that's a secret source to professionalizing it properly. Uh, it's not to say it's not professionalized now, but you, you're absolutely right where in my travels, in my career, I've seen some wonderful different ways of, of doing the same thing. <laughs> some some right. better than others. Yeah. Um, and I, and I, I I've maybe even made a career out of, uh, going to places which are broken um, and, yeah. and kind of looking like I'm really good at my job. Um, in reality, I'm just applying best practice that I've learned elsewhere. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, if you just think that if that best practice was centralized somewhere, yeah, it just uplift the whole profession uh, overnight. Absolutely. And also, I mean, there are organizations out there, right? Um, and they're trying mm. to do exactly this. Um, GWFM comes to mind. You're yep. familiar with them. Yep. Um, SWPP. Yep. I mean, AWAM. There are several workforce management organizations out there uh, who are really trying to push the message out. Unfortunately, we're almost siloed, right? Mm -hmm. And so there isn't there isn't a there doesn't seem to be a good way to bring all those voices uh, together. It's interesting you say that, by the way, because um, I'm, I'm hoping the, that we can have an episode at some point where we have the GWFM, the, the, the forum in the UK that kind of represent what well, used to be called the Professional Planning Forum, um, mm -hmm. the SWP, and have it all on one episode um, to kind of be amazing. Be super cool. Yeah. Uh, and if any of those organizations are listening to this episode, um, please reach out to me. Um, because, uh, yeah, I'd love to put that together. I think that, that'd be a really great step forward. So my dream for you is if you get those organizations, right, onto one episode, the very next episode you get, you get all the vendors. If you, the vendors are where it's at because they're the ones who have the reach into the organizations. Mm. If you can get, you know, Genesis, Verant, Nice, to even just even if we start off with call center, right? If we if you got if you got all the call center vendors to come together, and essentially support an organization, they don't need to finance it. Or if they support one organization, and then that organization then starts 
you know, essentially delivering the coursework of a, of a general workforce management supported by these five, three, mm-hmm. four firms. I mean, that's enough to get it growing. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, who knows? And maybe it will make it happen. It's certainly, certainly on my on my bucket list. Um, so I'll, I'll I'll keep you posted in the brain on that one for sure. Please um, do. We're coming to a bit of a close, and I'm I'm conscious of that time. Um, but I've got a, a few sort of, sort of final questions for you. First of all, what advice would you want to give? to your younger self um, pursuing a workforce management career? Uh, and I, I know that this would be a bit of a weird question because you would think, well, my younger self probably wouldn't want to pursue a workforce management career. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, for somebody coming into the industry, um, you kind of like this, their first job, they probably have no knowledge of what they've just let themselves in for. What, what, what advice would you give for, for, a, for a newbie to workforce management? Interesting. So if I was a newbie in workforce management today, uh, as opposed to when I was coming up, the path to growth is different, but it's not laid out for you. Mm. Right? It's not like the finance where, you know, you start off as an analyst and there are all these roles to get you to CFO. So it, it would be to envision what, you know, essentially what your path, what you want your path to be. Um, WFM, unfortunately, it's a great starting place to a lot of yeah. other um, roles, if you will, right? Yeah. So if you're a master of WFM, you can you can be in, in operations easy. You can head operations, you can head finance, you can even head HR for that matter, mm. uh, uh, because you understand what your, what your employees are going through, their experiences. Uh, you can speak to that employee experience in a way that no one in the organization can, not even HR, uh, surprisingly enough. So I think WFM is a great stepping stone into a lot of other yeah, career yeah. paths. 100% agree. Unfortunately, you know, there are very few organizations that have a path up WFM. Mm. They, t- they tend to be larger. Uh, they tend to be multinational or global organizations. But, you know, so if you wanted to stick within Workforce management, I'd say look for organizations that have a multinational footprint or global footprint, uh, and then, you know, plan your growth within workforce management that way. Otherwise, um, look at it as a stepping stone to other career paths. Brilliant, brilliant advice. Um, You just need to go back in time now and tell your, your younger self that. (laughs) Um. (laughs) Well, so that's, no, so if I, for my younger self, I tell myself, Honestly, I would try to push this evangel. I, I started late, um, mm. but but evangelizing about workforce management, I would I'd want to start my own shop. Yeah, uh, yeah. To 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 really tell that story, that's what I would have done for myself. But if I was advising noobs today, you know, that's what I would uh, do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and do you know the, the funny thing about that I'm, is. Um, I mean, I look at myself now, and I'm obviously on a, on a podcast. But if I go back 20 years when I first started, I was that classic introvert that really didn't want to speak to anybody. And, <laughs> um, and, um, and I think actually a lot of workforce management professionals, because they're good with numbers, they're analytical, they naturally yeah. aren't great at evangelizing. And yet, I think that as technology grows and, yeah. and some of the nuances around, or well, some of the tasks that were sort of naturally a sort of admin task for, for what management are getting automated yeah. it's actually through the soft skills and the ability to translate numbers into something meaningful that is i think now becoming a much bigger skill set for, for for workforce management um gone are the days when you could sit in a dark room behind a screen in a spreadsheet <laughs> and never have to interact with anybody um okay. absolutely I, I mean i could talk to you all day but i think we probably should wrap it up no Just worries. Worries final question before we close um we we talked about kind of um what you'd say to younger self what you'd say to a newbie um what are the best workforce management resources that that have helped you along your way uh, in your career today resources um when i was getting started they all came from the vendor Mm. um but then once i once i got into it, it it was a matter of of really understanding the business outcomes so always go to whatever your leadership is trying to do, uh, understand the outcome that they're hoping to realize, and then figuring out how to get there. 
that's what we do as operational leaders uh, within workforce management. So, you know, whatever you want to do within your work has to be guided by what's the ultimate reason why you're doing it, what's the outcome. Um, and there's not always a place to go and research that, right? Like, how do you, you mm-hmm. know, how do you optimize this or how do you, how do you make more efficient, you know, this type of operations versus that one? That's not always there. But if you understand what, what you're trying to do, um, you, will, you will typically know how to, how to, how to get there. I think that's a wonderful place to finish. Um, yeah, I'm a big believer in outcomes as well. I think the outcome can lead you down a really great path. Um, so I think that's wonderful advice. And uh, sadly, and maybe we do a part two at some point, but sadly, we're going to have to end it there. Um, but, okay. but Napoleon, huge thanks for setting aside some time today to be our guest. Um, you really are a rock star. Um, oh, hey. super interesting <laughs> insights and thoughts um, and um, yeah I, I feel like I've learned a lot as well from from you so I really appreciate it thank you so much it's 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 an honor to 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 be here I'm guest number four uh, you five. guest number f- five um, yeah love it, love so, it. that's gonna go on my resume <laughs> <laughs> take care have a great day thank you very have much one, cheers Thank you for listening to VWFM. This podcast is made and produced by André Leitão, Bilga Hentelun, Doug Carsten, Gonçalo Gomes, and Kim Paz. If you like this show, don't forget to share it with your friends and colleagues. Visit our website, vwfm.com, to find more exclusive interviews and WFM content. See you next time. All rights reserved.